chain of events, cause and effect. We analyse what went right and what went wrong, as we discover that many outcomes can be predicted, planned for, and even prevented. I'm John Chigi, and this is Causality. This episode is brought to you by Clubhouse, the first project management platform for software development that brings everyone on every team together to build a better product. Visit this URL, clubhouse, or one word, .io slash 10, the word, for more information. We'll talk more about them during the show. Causality is part of the Engineered Network. To support our shows, including this one, head over to our Patreon page, and for other great shows, visit engineered.network today. Bhopal. In the late evening on the 2nd and early morning on the 3rd of December, 1984, a pesticide chemical plant in Bhopal, India, an incident with the release of toxic gas would lead to the worst industrial incident in all of recorded human history. Bhopal is the capital city of the state of Madhya Pradesh in central India and is located 700 miles or 1,100 kilometers approximately west-northwest of Kolkata. Bhopal is known as the City of Lakes, named after the many both natural and artificial lakes both in and surrounding the city, and is considered to be one of the greenest cities in India. Today, Bhopal's metropolitan area comprises a population of approximately 2 million people, though at the time of the incident, the city was home to about half that. In 1969, the Indian branch of the Union Carbide Corporation, Union Carbide India Limited, or UCIL, built a factory in Bhopal to service the local farming industry, following a government directive in 1966 to increase crop yields such that India could become self-sufficient in terms of its food production. The primary pesticide component in the initial design was focused on alpha naphthol production, though in 1973, the government tightened import regulations which encouraged Union Carbide to manufacture the previously imported Sevin locally in India. Sevin was UCC Bayer's trademark name for Carbaryl, which Union Carbide formulated and began selling in 1958. Even today, Carbaryl remains the third most popular insecticide in the United States. There are multiple chemical processes used to manufacture Carbaryl, but at the time the plant was built, Union Carbide was already operating a plant in Institute, West Virginia, that used a chemical called MIC as a key part of that process. The Bhopal design was modified in 1978 to expand alpha naphthol production. However, the $2.5 million US dollar project failed on initial commissioning, and rather than persist with this process, a decision was made to shift to an MIC production process with a further investment of two million US dollars. In 1979, the plant began production of Sevin using MIC. At the time, other manufacturers used this process as well, though in subsequent years, most other manufacturers moved to a more expensive, though safer process that didn't use MIC as its key component. Methyl isocyanate, MIC, that was used in the production of the seven pesticide reacts with water to create dimethylurea and carbon dioxide gas, and this is an exothermic reaction. The reaction rate accelerates as temperature increases, and it is recommended that MIC is kept below 40 degrees Celsius, or 104 Fahrenheit, under pressure at all times. MIC boils at 38.3 degrees Celsius, or 100 Fahrenheit, at standard temperature and pressure, and because it reacts so violently with water, it is highly toxic to animals, including humans. And about the incident itself. Sometime between 8 and 9 p.m. in the evening on Sunday, the 2nd of December, 1984, the second shift production supervisor directed the MIC plant supervisor to flush several pipes between the phosgene system and the scrubbers due to particulate buildup. At 9.30 p.m., the flush procedure began, and initially... No water was observed coming out the other end. After a longer than normal delay, water began to finally flow and the personnel proceeded, assuming there was no cause for concern. At 10.30pm, the second shift clocked off, while the third shift came on and took over the flushing procedure. At 11pm, Suman Day, the third shift control room operator, observed the pressure in the MIC tank E610, had risen from 2 psi to 10 psi 
in the last 30 minutes, noting that even at 25 psi that was considered to be acceptable, and hence no action was taken. At midnight, a minor gas leak was found by plant personnel and phoned into the control room by the maintenance crew on shift. They had reported that they detected an MIC leak. They had set up a water spray in the area impacted to neutralise the gas, then took their tea break to discuss how best to isolate and repair the leak. Minor gas leaks were commonplace at the plant, and workers had become used to managing them in this way. Suman Day took that call and looked over the readings on the control panel, noting that by 12.15am, tank E610 was reporting between 25 and 30 psi, and was now a cause of some concern. By 12.30am, the pressure had climbed to 55 psi, and wishing to confirm the control room reading at the source, Suman left the control room and headed to the storage area. The MIC storage tanks were kept buried underground to keep them cool, installed under a thick concrete slab. Upon reaching the chemical storage area, Suman felt heat emanating from the slab, noting the concrete was also vibrating. Upon hearing a very loud hissing noise, later described like high-pressure steam venting from a steam engine boiler, he ran back to the control room. By 12.35am, Suman had returned to the control room and began the emergency procedure designed to neutralise the gas via the vent gas scrubber. The vent gas scrubber forces exhausting gas through caustic soda, rendering the gas inert by the time it exits for final venting to atmosphere. The vent gas scrubber had been kept offline whilst no sevin was being produced, and Suman's attempts to re-enable it and bring it online weren't successful, as caustic soda did not begin to flow through the scrubber at all. The gas could not reach the flare tower, as it had been offline for several weeks awaiting pipework repairs, and the gas vented, untreated, into the atmosphere at the top of the vent gas scrubber. At 12.40am, the operator sounded the evacuation sirens, both in plant and externally, that could be heard in the surrounding neighbourhoods. At 12.45am, the external audible siren was turned off. The plant personnel attempted to cool tank E610 using the Freon coolant system. However, the Freon refrigerant had been drained in previous months. A southeast wind was blowing that evening, blowing the MIC gas toward the centre of Bhopal. By 1am in the morning, the leading edge of the gas cloud had reached the first heavily populated residential areas of Bhopal. As it had travelled through the atmosphere, it had cooled enough that it began to sink towards the ground. As the gas was heavier than air, it's also not visible to the human eye. Exposure to MIC gas at low concentrations in humans results in coughing, chest pain, dyspnea, asthma, irritation of the eyes, nose and throat. Higher levels of exposure, however, over 21 parts per million can result in pulmonary or lung edema, emphysema, hemorrhages, bronchial pneumonia, and ultimately death. Throughout Bhopal, people began to cough violently as the gas reacted with the water in their lungs. Their eyes began to burn, obscuring their vision, and people began to wake up from their sleep choking for breath. The streets of Bhopal, normally very quiet in the middle of the night, became flooded with people, some still dressed in their sleeping attire, in a mass panic, trying to escape the gas and find fresh air to breathe. As those people ran, they ingested even more toxic gas at an even higher rate. Closest to the ground, where the concentration of the MIC gas was at its highest. Those that had inhaled the highest concentrations began vomiting and became partly paralysed. Some that had stopped suddenly due to vomiting were trampled by others who were running to escape. Between 12.40am and 1.30am back at the plant, in a vain effort to stop the untreated gas from escaping, Workers attempted to use fire hoses to spray down the gas, leaving the top of the vent gas scrubber. However, the spray from the hoses wasn't high enough to reach the gas, let alone neutralise it at that height. At 2.30am, the external gas siren was once again turned on. By 7am that morning, the gas had finally dissipated. 
The official death toll from the government was 2,259 people. Though a government affidavit in 2006 claimed that there were 38,478 temporary partial injuries, 3,900 permanent disabling injuries, and 558,125 suffering from exposure to the gas in total to that date. Late Monday afternoon, the day of the incident, the Indian Central Bureau of Investigation took over the plant and took control of all of its records. The CBI barred all others from speaking to plant employees and denied access to site by all other parties, including the operating company, without their permission. The government sent Dr. Virada Jaran, a chemist, on the 4th of December to assess the condition of the plant and to make the plant safe. During his visit, they determined that the E610 tank had been 75% full, well over the recommended 50% maximum for these MIC tanks, and contained 42 tonnes of liquid MIC. UCC's CEO Warren Anderson from the United States came to inspect the damage shortly after the incident and was arrested on site by the local police upon his arrival. He wasn't put into a prison cell, but instead was taken to the Union Carbide guest facilities for several hours. Once he was released on bail, he fled the country the same day, having been denied access to the facility by the CBI. It was found by Dr. Vajaradin's team that there was still 35 tonnes of MIC remaining in the Bhopal factory following the incident between the two remaining MIC tanks. In order to neutralise it, the only viable option was to consume it, but that would require running the plant up again. And as a precaution, firefighting helicopters filled with water were put into service and a wet canvas cloth was draped over key sections of the facility to act as a neutraliser should any gas chance to escape. On the 16th of December 1984, only two weeks after the incident and with the death toll from the incident still climbing, a team of industrial chemists and Union Carbide personnel restarted the plant. News of the impending restart triggered a second exodus, with many of the remaining residents that were still physically able to then evacuated the city. It took seven days to produce enough of the Sevin pesticide to completely consume the remaining MIC in storage. The plant was temporarily shut down pending investigation, but in July 1985, the government rejected a renewal of its operating licence, and it has remained closed ever since. The government and industrial situation in India led to multiple, very different sets of investigations, with the CBI effectively locking others out, and Union Carbide maintaining the incidents was a case of industrial sabotage gone wrong. Various external investigators from the United States and India have provided their own versions of events, some of which conflict with physical access to the plant highly controlled, most of the sequences of events were built from the many different groups of people speaking to the plant personnel following the incident. The majority of the following findings we'll discuss come from the report on scientific studies in the factors related to Bhopal toxic gas from the New Delhi Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, December 1985, by Dr. S. et al. In addition, the account of the incident from a 12-person U.S. team, including Michael J. Wright, the then Director of Occupational Health and Safety for the United Steelworkers of America, is also included. Michael Wright and the U.S. team had to travel on tourist visas and, like others, were denied entry to the plant. But he and the U.S. team took long-distance photos of the tanks and pipework in the plant and they were able to obtain a copy of the operating manual for the plant and over a long period of time, were able to speak with each of the personnel on shift the night of the incident through unofficial means. Before we go any further, I'd like to talk about our sponsor for this episode, and that's Clubhouse, the first project management platform for software development that brings everyone on every team together to build better products. Clubhouse was built from the outset with agile development in mind with an intense focus on intuitiveness and responsiveness. With their web app backed by Fastly CDN, it really feels like a local app on any platform. Clubhouse delivers developer-centric tools for everything from Kanban boards to epics, milestones, cards, with different card classifications for features, bugs, and chores. 
but it's more Clubhouse's ability to interconnect all of them together that's so impressive. Users have reported creating less duplicates, navigation is very fast using a common board, but with as many configurable workspaces as you like to customize that board for whatever purpose you might need. Morning stand-ups for different teams, sub-teams, or all the teams, it's up to you. Ultimately, any collaborative project management platform has to be as low friction as possible, and not just for software developers, but for everyone in the organization, marketing, support, management, you name it, the lot. So everyone can contribute and actual collaboration actually happens. Finally, the other part of Clubhouse that really shines is its ability to zoom out from individual tasks to the overall project status that not only keeps project managers happy, but keeps the team connected to how their part contributes to the greater project and keeps them focused on what matters, delivering a result their customers will enjoy. There are others in the market, but they're not like Clubhouse, and what makes Clubhouse so different is the balance between the right amount of simplicity without sacrificing key functionality, structured to allow genuine cross-functional team collaboration on your project. Clubhouse is a modern software-as-a-service platform with seamless integrations for popular tools like GitHub, Slack, Sentry, and lots more. And if the tools you want to integrate it with aren't available out of the box, an extensible REST API in Clubhouse makes integrations straightforward. If you visit this URL, clubhouse, or one word, .io, slash 10, the word, you can take advantage of a special offer for engineered network listeners. Of course, you'll get the 14-day free trial, but if you sign up, you'll get two months free, and because this is a team-centric solution, this offer will work for your team, not just you. This offer is only available to engineered network listeners for a limited time, so take advantage of it while you can. Thank you to Clubhouse for sponsoring the engineered network. Three tanks in total held MIC, and operating instructions recommended that one tank be kept spare at all times, and each at no more than a 50% level for emergency transferal in the event a tank was compromised. However, all three were at or well above the 50% level prior to the incident. After digging tank E610 out of the concrete, it was found that the tank itself hadn't ruptured, though it was swollen, but the emergency pressure relief valve had ruptured, and the gas was released through the venting system. It was determined that approximately 500 kilograms of water had entered the tank and mixed with iron particles from poorly corrosion-protected pipework, otherwise known as rust, leading to a runaway exothermic reaction, overpressurizing the tank and rupturing the pressure relief valve. So how did the water get into the tank? A process unit adjacent to the chemical storage unit would become backed up from time to time and needed to be cleaned out. The cleaning process used a high-pressure hose, fitting a slip blind and running water under pressure through the partially clogged lines for several hours. Sometime in May 1984, that jumper line was installed connecting the pressure valve and vent line, RVVL, and the process vent header, PVH, effectively creating a path between the ISO unit and the MIC chemical storage area. Personnel had flushed out the jumper line the evening of the incident. The Nitrogen Barrier Normal operating procedure with MIC and liquid storage is to pressurise the MIC tanks with nitrogen gas, and maintain a set pressure as an additional barrier to MIC coming out of solution and interacting with the tank or with oxygen that could be trapped in the tank. On the 13th of November, some 20 days prior, the first record in the maintenance log reported they were unable to set and maintain a nitrogen gas pressure in tank E610. No pressure readings were documented, with the most likely cause being unable to pressurise the tank due to a faulty valve or a leaking valve seal. A pressurization test on the 24th of November also failed on tank E610. If the valve wasn't able to hold nitrogen under pressure, that is, it was allowing gas to escape, it was just as able to allow a dense liquid like water to enter the tank. The refrigerant. In June that year, five months prior to the incident, the Freon cooling system had its influence on the tank temperature significantly reduced by adjusting the cooling set point up to 20 degrees Celsius, that's 68 Fahrenheit, from the design set point of only 4.5 degrees Celsius or 40 degrees Fahrenheit. This was done following a series of MIC leaks in that cooling system. It was determined that the system was stable without coolant flow and the coolant was removed and sent to other plants as a cost reduction measure. By the time of the incident, the Freon tanks were completely empty and offline 
meaning that any runaway reaction could not be slowed or potentially even stopped through cooling. The sabotage theory from Union Carbide. During the initial stages of the Union Carbide investigation, the company claimed that the incident was most likely the cause of intentional sabotage. They cited the finding at 10 a.m. on the morning of the incident where a pressure gauge was missing from the pipework leading to the MIC tanks. Although no evidence was found to definitively indicate that water ingress occurred at that point of any volume, nor was any individual ever named or identified as the purported saboteur. The vent gas scrubber and flare tower. The VGS was offline at the time. However, design calculations were intended to handle small-scale venting of local pipework through regular procedures and effectively meant that even had it been operational, it would not have been able to neutralise all of the escaping MIC. A four-foot section of pipework that led to the flare tower had also been removed and it had been put out of service, awaiting repair. After the incident, plant personnel suggested the replacement job would have taken approximately two hours to complete. However, it was not considered to be a high-priority job. The flare tower had been offline for several weeks leading up to the incident. Finally, the fire hosing system was not sufficiently powerful to spray a single jet of water to the exit point of the tower under any operating conditions. The vent on the vent gas scrubber was 120 feet or 36 meters high and at full flow and pressure the water jets could only reach 100 feet or 30 meters high. Union Carbide in the United States had advised the local plant managers to install larger pipes and more powerful pumps as early as 1981. However, these were never installed by local management and no records of practice drills in the year leading up to the incident were found. There were also smaller incidents leading up to the disaster. Between 1981 and 1984, there were five reported incidents at the plant leading up to the December 1984 incident, with one in 1981 injuring three personnel initially, with one of those people dying later as a result of his injuries. Those findings from the investigation describe the specific items that failed, but ultimately we're more interested in what actually went wrong in the years leading up to the incident. Let's start with the upgrade. The design upgrade in the late 70s was scaled based on two key assumptions. Export of Sevin from India to Union Carbide's external markets would mean cost reductions in other business divisions. And... Savin would be in high demand in the local market in India. In 1980, the government loans given to stimulate the farming market in the 70s came due, and many farmers struggled to repay them, meaning they had no option but to choose cheaper pesticides. This resulted in a significant impact to the commercial sales and viability of the Savin product manufactured at Bhopal. In mid-1979, Union Carbide's Eastern Division moved to not export Savin to other countries for fear that it would impact the local viability of those other plants producing it in non-Indian markets. Whilst some of this was observed during the later stages of the physical upgrades to the Bhopal plant, it was considered to be too late to scale back the construction activity. This led to a situation where there was a very large quantity of MIC storage capacity at the Bhopal site, and relatively little production to consume it. Not only that, but a key decision regarding the sizing of the vent gas scrubber during the upgrade was to not increase its size. In similar sized plants handling the intended production quantities of MIC, the scrubbers were recommended to be at least four times the size of those installed at Bhopal. Hence, the size of the scrubber was completely unable to handle a full flow of gas exhausted from any single MIC tank. In addition, the upgrade did not add a second flare tower, as was standard practice at similar-sized plants using the same process in other parts of the world. The Indian government had also placed strict rules on the use of locally manufactured parts during construction, meaning that imported high-grade stainless steel was substituted for locally made carbon steel leading to corrosion issues. This was cited as a contributing factor to why there were so many leaks at the plant, driving a highly reactive maintenance culture, 
which is fundamentally opposed with cost reduction in the long term. Due to the aforementioned company and broader economic reasons, Union Carbide weren't making the amount of Sevin the plant had been designed for at full capacity, leaving significant quantities of MIC stored under the ground, and importantly, for significant periods of time. Next was the incorrect flushing procedure. The MIC personnel on the evening of the incident were unaware that fitting the slip blind was a required component of the safety procedure, and given the fitting of the blind could take between 30 minutes and 2 hours, it was not fitted prior to the flushing sequence commencing. The slip blind was required to be fitted to physically block the entry of water into the MIC tank as a second layer of protection against a potentially leaking MIC tank outlet valve. The maintenance supervisor that usually coordinated the flush procedure had been made redundant only days prior to the incident. It was clear that the personnel in both shifts did not appreciate the importance of the slip blind and previous flushes managed by the maintenance supervisor who had been let go had ensured it had been fitted correctly those times. Hence, a lack of handover and knowledge transfer from employees with a poor focus on basic training surrounding the procedure heavily contributed to the incident. So what do we learn from this? The problem is there are so many lessons to be learned, it's hard to know where to start. Excessive cost reduction at the plant, lack of knowledge transfer between departing staff, we ultimately we want to consider as an engineer working on the plant or the plant's design, what could have been done differently? Understanding the impacts of cost reduction, many of the gauges in the plants hadn't been calibrated for a significant period of time due to staff reduction, meaning operators had learned to not trust the readings in the plant. Why fix the cooling system leaks when you can just shut it off and use the refrigerant somewhere else? Emergency cooling's optional, apparently. Downward pressure on pay scales at the plant gradually saw a brain drain, where those that were trained by USA's uh, Union Carbide personnel gradually left the plant and went elsewhere to better paying jobs. Training of new personnel was ad hoc with most of the training manuals written in English and lacking many bilingual staff, since most had already left for better jobs, meant that many staff were unaware of the risks of handling MIC. Rather than continue to go on about those, let's focus on engineering specific components such as management of change or MOC and appropriately sized protection measures. Let's talk about management of change first. Not taking MOC seriously was a huge contributor. Firstly, removing the refrigerant as a safety backup, evidence of engineering review or sign-off wasn't found. Secondly, the bypass or jumper line relying on a manually fitted blind during flushing. Well, relying on administrative procedures, manually implemented safety controls, that's an absolute last resort. Of course, the counter-argument is that you can you justify the cost of an automated isolation valve or even fitting a quicker-to-operate but still more expensive manual isolation valve if that isolation procedure is very rarely undertaken. There's no evidence to suggest that the risk of failure to follow the administrative procedure was ever assessed. Whilst it's true that there was an isolation valve already in that line, it's common practice to never trust a single valve to Im- and to implement a so-called double block arrangement where you close two valves in series. Rather than fitting another isolation valve, the slip line was cheaper but ultimately easier to forget to fit, especially for inexperienced personnel. The bypass line itself wasn't even on the design drawings, nor on any formal review drawing markup since. This suggests it never went through a formal design review process or a formal risk assessment procedure. Another aspect of MOC is like-for-like replacement, in this case of stainless steel for carbon steel, for multiple pipework sections. They're not even remotely similar in terms of such things as brittle fracture temperature and corrosion resistance, and yet during construction, the design had parts substituted based on a government directive with minimal engineering review. I've seen it time and again with MOC, where in one case a completely different, complex component is proposed as being like for like, when it was something from a completely different vendor with totally different specifications 
different everything. But just because it did the same thing, it was attempted to be sold just as if it was completely like for like. Like for like means that its key design parameters are the same at a component level. So for pipework and gauges, that means the same corrosion resistance, the same purity, the same thickness, all of it. If you substitute components from a design basis, you need to have it properly reviewed by a multiple discipline team to make sure the substitution is a genuine like-for-like and it remains fit for purpose for that application. It's often the case that these sorts of changes don't have impacts immediately and short-term cost reductions are claimed at the time as, oh, hey, we just saved X million dollars. But in the long term, the end-to-end cost of that mentality is many, many more in the end. Always size protection systems for beyond the worst case scenario. When the plant was expanded, the protection measures should also have been increased in size as well to handle a full loss of MIC via the scrubber. For safety systems, we also have to regularly test that they function or record any and all safety equipment bypasses or isolations and keep that as a highly visible operational risk that's regularly reviewed, maybe even on a shift-by-shift basis. Otherwise, when we need the safety system to act, they can't. And that means you're operating without any safety system at all. It may as well not even be fitted to the plant. At Bhopal, the safety systems they had were offline and bypassed, may as well not have been installed. Financially then, by 1984, Union Carbide had actually cut 1.25 million US from the Bhopal plant's annual operating cost. And even at that point, it was still losing money and they were trying to cut it back even more. And as is so often the case with incidents like this, the cost-cutting measures taken in the years and months leading up to the incident a pocket change compared to the costs after the incident in money alone, let alone human life, which you can't put a price on. In February of 1989, the Indian Supreme Court and Government of India agreed to a settlement with Union Carbide Corporation for a total of 470 million US dollars, which works out to approximately $600 US per victim, with UCC granted immunity from all future prosecution. In 2010, eight former managers were convicted of death by negligence and fined $2,125 US each. One of the named managers had passed away when the sentence was handed down, whilst the then CEO Warren Anderson was initially named as a ninth. As he was based in the United States, he was outside of the Indian court system's jurisdiction. None of the convicted UGIL personnel were imprisoned and multiple claims against UCIL and UCC for compensation have failed. Union Carbide continues to maintain it was a victim of sabotage and despite multiple internal restructures, some arms of UCC remain operating chemical plants throughout the world today. The plant at Bhopal has become derelict with groundwater in the vicinity toxic and visiting the site requires a breathing apparatus, otherwise inhaling toxic dust will lend you in hospital, as it did a photojournalist in 2010. There remain no firm plans to properly rehabilitate the site. Bhopal remains a highly populated city in central India, with people scarred by the poisoning and families still shattered decades later, with parts of the city covered in graffiti demanding justice for something that it seems to have been forgotten by the rest of the world at large. Businesses have to be economical to survive, which means there's always a balance between operational cost and safety. You can design a plant that has many multiple layers of protection, highly maintenance intensive, and to ensure that it remains safe, and be so expensive that you go out of business. You can design a plant with no safety features at all, kill lots of people, and you go out of business. Or you should. Successful businesses exist somewhere in the middle of those two extremes. When you're dealing with toxic chemicals, explosive materials, things that are extremely dangerous, 
to your own personnel or to those innocent people that happen to live or pass by close proximity to the plant that you're operating, that will always come at a higher cost. Continuing to operate a plant below a safety margin is not an option. If you're not making money making something, then stop making it and get into a different business. Stop trying to cut corners to make something viable when it just can't be. The problems seem to come when people that make these cost-cutting decisions to drive up value and improve profit regularly come from backgrounds that don't include process and or chemical safety. There are some industries where you just can't cut corners. There are some risks that are just too great to ignore. If you're going to work in a company that's cutting these sorts of corners, it's your job to raise your concerns as high as you have to to see that they listen. If you see this sort of behavior happening around you, if you see people trading risk for profit or viability, then it's your job to stand up to it. Be the voice for the people that don't get a choice. Anyone can save a dollar today. That's easy. Designing and building something that's reliable, cost-effective, safe, and fit for purpose. That's what engineering is. And it's hard to get those trade-offs right and to get that balance right. No matter how you look at it, both UCC and UCIL got their balance horrifically wrong at Bhopal and thousands of innocent people died because of that. If you're enjoying Causality and want to support the show, you can via Patreon at patreon.com slash johnchigi or one word. A thank you to all of our patrons and a special thank you to our silver producers, Carsten Hansen and John Whitlow. And an extra special thank you to our gold producer, known only as R. Patron rewards include a named thank you on the website, a named thank you at the end of episodes, access to raw detailed show notes, as well as ad-free higher quality releases of every episode with patron audio now also available via individual breaker audio feeds. So if you'd like to contribute something, anything at all, there's lots of great rewards. And beyond that, it's all really, really appreciated. Beyond that, there's lots of other ways to help, like leaving a rating or review on iTunes, favoriting this episode in your podcast player app, or sharing the episode or the show with your friends or via social. All these things help others discover the show and make a huge difference. I'd personally like to thank Clubhouse for sponsoring the Engineered Network. If you're looking for an easy-to-use software development project management solution that everyone can use, remember to specifically visit this URL, clubhouse or one word, .io, slash 10 the word to check it out and give it a try. It'll surprise you just how easy it can be. Causality is part of the Engineered Network and you can find it at engineered.network and you can follow me on the Fediverse at chigi at engineered.space or the network on Twitter at engineered underscore net. This was Causality. I'm John Chigi. Thanks for listening.